come now to a second point under uh, biblical foundations, and that is the biblical mandate for church planting. Now, we've already gone through some practical reasons, but um, practical reasons, you know, will only take you so far. Now, we've had this first point about how central, I believe, that the planting of kingdom community churches is to the Missio Dei. But let's look a little more closely at uh, what I would call biblical mandate. Some people say, well, there's a command to make disciples in the Bible, but there's no command to go plant churches. And so is really church planting that important? And I believe that as we look at scripture, we'll see that absolutely church planting is very central. Um, first of all, church planting is in continuity with, the, uh, with salvation history. And what I mean by that is what we've already spoken of is that God has continually throughout the Bible worked through a people. And he has called to create this new people in the New Testament. And one of the dramatic shifts from Old Testament to New Testament is that shift from a centralized people of God. The people of Israel, they lived in a land, they had a national identity, they had the temple, they had centralized worship, they had the law, and they were to draw the nations to themselves. They were to be to manifest the rule of God as a nation. And the nations were to look at Israel and say, who has a God like the people of Israel? But there's a dramatic shift in the New Testament that even the disciples early along didn't quite understand. Do you remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? She asked Jesus a question. Um, she said, Jesus, uh, which mountain is the right mountain to worship on? Because the Samaritans, she was a Samaritan, they worshiped on one mountain. Of course, the Jews worshiped on another mountain and in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the temple. She was worried about the locality of worship. And you remember what Jesus said? He said, the day's coming and is that God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, the mountain, the place of worship is not going to be essential. He was looking forward to that day when the gospel and God's people would break out and no longer be centralized, but become a movement of God's people among all people. And this is, of course, what happened at Pentecost. The, as the Holy Spirit came and the disciples were speaking in other languages, they're speaking the gospel in pagan languages, showing that not even the Hebrew language is going to be important. In fact, it's an interesting thing sometimes we overlook. The New Testament is not written in the language of Jesus. Jesus spoke Aramaic. And we say, well, wait a minute. I want to have the real words of Jesus. I don't want to just have a translation. I want the real words of Jesus, right? But there's only a few places in the New Testament where we actually have the Aramaic words of Jesus. You, you might remember what those are when uh, he was on the cross. And the New Testament gives us Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabatani, where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just a few places where Jesus, where we have actually the Aramaic of Jesus. Well, what we're being told is that the gospel is for all peoples now. It's not limited to the people of Israel. It's not limited to even the language of its founder. Very different from Islam. Shouldn't even translate the Quran out of the Arabic. And yet the gospel we have, the only gospel we have, is already a translated gospel. Now, what this means is that as salvation history has progressed with God calling Abraham and saying, you're going to be a blessing to all the nations, he forms the people of Israel. They were meant to be a blessing to the nations. He says, you were to be my servant, but you, you failed me, and I'm going to send a true servant who will be the light to the nations. That was the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, was, became the light to the nations. But then later on, Paul says of him and Barnabas, we, the church, are now a light to the nations. He quotes that same passage. And so what we're seeing is that God has always been at work through a people. And now in this day and age, he expects that people to be spread among all the earth. And we have the vision of Revelation. 
Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, Revelation 7, 9 and 10, where it says that, that the Lamb is worthy of worship because He's purchased men among every people, nation, tribe, and tongue. And so we are a part of that movement now as the gospel moves out. And where's the temple now? What does Paul say? We're living stones. We are the temple of God now. Wherever God's people are coming together, we are those living stones. Peter uses that language that are being built into a temple of worship. That's who we are as the church. It's not a temple in Jerusalem. It's not in any one place. It's not with any one ethnic group or language group. Wherever the new people of God come together, there's the temple. There's true worship. There's the people of God. Now that's, that's the church. And those churches have to be planted and come into existence among every people. And so church planting is in continuity with the flow of God's movement in salvation history till we look forward to that day when ev there will be those from every people, nation, tribe who have been redeemed. Furthermore, Christ loves the church and gave himself for the church. Find this in Ephesians chapter 5. Christ loves the church and gave himself for the church. He wants to build the church. Remember, this is what he said to, to uh, Peter in Matthew 16. He said, you're this, the rock. And on that rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus himself is the ultimate church planter. Jesus himself is the builder of the church. So if somebody says, well, church planting, I don't know about that. Jesus builds the church. I want to do what Jesus does. I want to be his instrument in doing what Jesus wants to do. This is his business. So when we talk about church planting being part of the mission of God, it's part of the mission of Jesus because he said, I will build my church. And of course, Ephesians 5, where husbands are exhorted to love their wives as Christ loves the church. Now, sometimes, as we said before, it's been said that church planning is one of the most effective methods of evangelism. Well, that may be, but Jesus loves the church. It's not, the church is not just a method of evangelism. Jesus loves the church. He's perfecting. He's beautifying the church. She's not always very pretty right now, this side of heaven. You know, the church still needs a little, uh, little work, you know, a little makeup, a little bit of uh, cleaning up. Um, but Jesus is beautifying the church. He's getting her ready for that great wedding day. We need to be a little careful about sometimes we become so critical of the church. Sometimes people are so negative of the church. I can tell you this, I don't like it when people talk negatively, critically about my wife. I don't think Jesus appreciates it when we speak critically of his bride, the church. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, we don't work to make the church a better place. But the church is Christ's bride. He loves the church. And so when we are building the church and we are expanding it, that is something that is near to the very heart of Jesus because the church is the bride of Christ. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 does not explicitly command us to go and plant churches, but it does entail church planting. It involves church planting to do that. So we're told to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to observe all that he commanded us. Now, how can we do that? without the church. First of all, even baptism itself is a sign of inclusion in the new people of God. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks about being baptized into the body of Christ. So even the command of baptism becomes an identification with the body of Christ. The command to baptize is the inclusion into this new community. Baptism has many meanings of 
the cleansing I do, or the washing away of our sins, the dying to the old life, the raising again to the new life. But baptism also indicates that being included in the new community of God's people. And so even the command to baptize implicitly has the idea of inclusion in this new community. And to make disciples who obey all that Jesus commanded of us, we need one another to do that. We can't do that alone. We can't do that in isolation. We have to do that in community. And so even the Great Commission in Matthew 28 implicitly implies the need for community and the church. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. The book of Acts demonstrates that new churches are the normal and necessary result of biblical evangelism and mission. Everywhere that the Apostle Paul goes and preaches the gospel, what happens? Believers are gathered into communities because we need one another. We can't exist in isolation. And so to make disciples, we have to gather people into communities we call churches. We only know of a couple of instances where the gospel was preached and churches didn't come into being. But even there, we're not sure. Can you remember what those incidences are? Think for a minute. One was the Ethiopian eunuch. But tradition has it that the Ethiopian eunuch, who believed and was baptized, tradition has it he took the gospel to Egypt, to North Africa, and started the movement there. So later on, in all likelihood, did become a church. And then Paul in Athens, we're told that there were only a few people who believed in Athens, and there's no mention of a church in Athens anywhere uh, else in the New Testament. So we really don't know for sure, but there's no explicit mention of a church. But everywhere else where the gospel's preached, churches are created. And so that becomes uh, a very important aspect. If we look, for example, an interesting thing of how when people are come to faith in Christ, they are brought into community. Uh, we see that at the very birth of the church in the book of Acts. If we look, for example, in Acts chapter 2, um, we find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says that those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, some Bible translations will even add the words added to the church that day. In other words, right there, it says that when people were baptized, they were added to the church. And then later on in Acts 2.47, it says, The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, grammatically, in the Greek, that's a present participle. They were being saved. In other words, as they were being saved, the Lord was adding them to the church. Sometimes we have this idea, um, somebody says, well, I, you know, I like Jesus, I don't like the church. Or I can be a Christian and I don't need the church. But the scripture tells us that as you are saved, God puts you in a church. He adds you to a community. It would be very exceptional for that not to happen. And so God himself places new believers in a community. This, this, the Greek word, by the way, that is translated added to, uh, that's prostithemi, it becomes actually a technical term. Even in the Jewish community, not even among Christians, the Jewish community used that word prostithemi to technically describe how a proselyte, a Gentile, became a Jew, that they were added to the Jewish community. And the New Testament takes that same word and says, now God adds you to the new community, the church. So it's an interesting detail of Scripture that just underlines this idea that God takes people and as they come to faith in Christ, 
they're added to the church. 